Hello and welcome to the Careers in Sport, Sport and Exercise webinar. My name is Amri Batson and I am your host. Now, competition in sport isn't just on the field or the track or even on the pitch. There is a huge diverse support industry behind the scenes and the list of professionals is endless. We've got nutritionists, physiotherapists, administrators, match officials and even physiotherapists and here's the thing careers in sport is an educational resource for people who want to work in the sports industry now did you know that over 200,000 14 to 18 year olds are studying for a qualification in the sports industry and careers in sport promotes diverse opportunities behind the scenes now i mentioned right at the beginning that this is a webinar in sport and exercise science and i'm not alone I am thankfully joined today by some leading professionals in this field who are going to talk to me about their journey, what they've learned along the way and give you some golden nuggets to take away for your own journey as well. So I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Oliver Harrington, who is the lead academy sports scientist at Reading FC. How are you doing, Oliver? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm very well. I'm also joined by Danny Holdcroft, who's Head of Performance at British Bobsleigh and Skeleton. How's it going? Good, thank you. Great. Also like to welcome Dr. Amy Whitehead, a reader in sports psychology and coaching and program manager for sports coaching and sports. Hello, Amy. Hi, thanks for having me on. And last but certainly not means least, Dr. Adam Glenhill, who is the Senior Lecturer in Sport and Exercise Psychology at Leeds Beckett University. Welcome, Dr. Adam Glenhill. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us all. Thank you. Lovely to see you as well. So let's get straight into it. The first topic I want to talk to you all about is your journey, because I'm sure you've had different experiences and it'd be great to share with people watching. So let's start with you, Amy. How did you get to where you are today and why did you choose a career in sport and exercise science? I think as a, a young a young girl, I was a huge kind of sport advocate, probably similar to everyone else, played every sport at school. Um, and I think I had some key influence in people in my life, such as I had a, my brother was a professional rugby player and my parents were big kind of advocates for sport and I had some really good teachers. So, and they always kind of pushed me in the direction of sport. Um, I was quite academic as well in secondary school um, and that pushed me to kind of go and study A-levels. Um, I, I picked kind of A-levels A around sport, kind of physical activity. Um, and I also uh, picked a psychology A level. So I think um, the, the love of sport, the love of psychology, um, I combined them at the age of um, 18 and I went to university to, to study sport psychology. And I guess from there it was study, study, study. So I went from undergrad, master's, PhD, um, HCPC registered sport and exercise psychologist and obviously working in higher education. Um, so I guess a combination of study, passion for sport um, and gaining as much work experience as possible over the last 10 years has kind of got me to where I am today. Danny, I'd like to ask you, as Head of Performance at British Bobsleigh and Skeleton, that's a winter sport. What made you fall in love with that sport and how did your journey start? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah we're not a winter sport nation, but um, I guess starting at the, at, the, at, the, at the top of my journey, a little bit similar to what we've just heard really in that I grew up um, obsessed with sport. Uh, football was my sport. And um, as a kid, all I wanted to do was play football and that was my, my career choice. But like, uh, like so many in the game, um, wasn't quite good enough to make it and, and got spat out at the, the academy stage. Um, for me, my route into where I'm at right now is, is kind of a bit of uh, hard work and, and starting at the bottom as a, as a fitness instructor and, and coaching uh, at the grassroots game of, of football and, and engineering opportunities through people I'm, I met and uh, doing voluntary work and doing five or six jobs and then lucky enough to, to mould it into um, my first full-time job in high performance sport with the LTA Lawn Tennis Association and, and their academy system. 
Uh, and then from there, in terms of skeleton and, and, and winter sport, uh, lucky enough, the, the psychologist within British tennis at that time was Simon Timpson. Um, many of us might, might know he was the performance director of skeleton. And um, we got chatting and, and an opportunity came up um, in Bath and, and that's kind of how I got into the sport. Um, to be quite honest, I wasn't a winter sport fan as a kid. I didn't really uh, watch the winter games. And um, yeah, I didn't really have a clue of what skeleton was when I, when I took the job, other than um, that it was a winter sport. It was more about the opportunity to work as uh, in performance sport that, 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 that excited me. <clears throat> it's because I was going to say to you, um, Danny, it's such a change, isn't it, to go from, you know, working in tennis as part of the LTA and then moving into a winter sport. How did you manage that transition? Uh, a transition was, was great, really. I think for, for me, um, winter sport at that time and, and particularly the what we were trying to establish within, within Skeleton uh, sits good with my kind of mindset of um, kind of doing things differently and, and and not just following traditional routes. And I think part of the part of the reason in tennis at that time, where I was getting a little bit frustrated and bored, was they had a very systematic way of uh, of working, which was quite uh, robotic. Same every day, two hours on court in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and and, and half an hour of um, physical work uh, after the last session. And I guess winter sport we were up against the odds and we had to go about trying to do things differently. And, and that for me really excited and actually uh, the trans transfer into, into that arena was, was quite easy and quite exciting. Thank you. Oliver, you work at Reading FC. You're the leading academy sports scientist. Let me guess you fell in love with football at a young age. Yeah. Uh, played football since I could, could walk really. Um, dad got me into it from a very, very early age. Um, similar to what's been mentioned, I, I, I had a, a I had a massive love for sport and all sports as well. I tried everything as a kid. I tried cricket, uh, diving, trampolining, um, badminton, all sorts, um, and I had a real love for sport. Took it onto my to my GCSEs, did sports studies, which was a big big driver for me. And then A level, I also did sports studies and psychology. So my initial route uh, when I did my um, degree was in sports psychology down at Bournemouth University um, and initially that's kind of the route I thought I was going to take. In my third year down at Bournemouth had to do a placement year and was lucky enough to secure one of those at Reading Football Club uh, working under a guy called Ed Franklin who um, who was my boss and mentor really um, but that was as a sports scientist and I guess that's kind of where I fell in love with sports science slightly more. Um, went back to do my final year at university um, was was sort of struggling about what I was going to do and then that's when the elite player performance plan uh, was put in meaning uh, there was a whole host of jobs that were put in place so each each academy in England was put into a, a categorization system and Reading were pushing for cat one at the time which meant that they had to there was a certain amount of rules they had to follow in terms of employing staff and I applied for the role and was lucky enough to get it um, worked with the sort of the younger younger kiddies under nice to under 16s for three years which which taught me a lot uh, you're working with sort of 150 kids and 25 to 30 different coaches so building relationships was was massive um and then after that three years i was lucky enough to uh get a, get a promotion up to work with the under 23s and i've been there for five years now um so that's that's kind of been my journey and still loving it still learning each day really Brilliant. Thank you. Adam, senior lecturer in sports and exercise psychology. That's that's quite a, a big topic. How did you get to that point of working at Leeds uh, Beckett University? Uh, yeah, so I, again, quite similar to a lot of the, the other uh, backgrounds that have been shared so far. I'm, I'm hugely interested in sport and active in sport as a, uh, as a young person all the way through. Um, I had a, a slightly different I guess changed tack. I originally wanted to, to go on into PE teaching and things like that, but I had a, a fairly fairly extensive injury record when I was younger, which meant that I wouldn't have been able to do that as well as I would have liked to. So I was just really quite lucky that the university at the time allowed me to change onto sport and exercise science. So I've kind of ended up in the early stages almost falling almost falling into it a little bit by by luck as well as, as having the right support mechanisms in place. Um but from there, yep, yeah, um <coughs> Excuse me. Master's qualification, PhD, uh, and a lot of you know a lot of time and effort spent around getting the right types of placements, getting the right types of experiences, working with 
uh, a range of different types of athletes across sports in terms of football and track and field athletics, rugby, uh, cycling, those sorts of things, uh, as well as working within different community sport type environments. And I think that the, the breadth and depth of experiences uh, are really quite an important part there because it allows you to develop not only your soft skills and your, your hard skills, um so you know from from that point of view that that blend of experiences has served me quite well um and again quite i guess quite different in some ways because i've progressed through from from further education um where i used to teach a lot on on btech programs and foundation degree programs and contribute to a level teaching and then about five six years ago I moved into universities so um yeah quite a quite a story quite a story history there You've all got fantastic stories about your briefly, you've told us about your career journey and where you are today. I want to ask you, each of you, about the careers and professions that are available in sport and exercise science. Because as somebody who doesn't work in that field, I can only assume that the word that was used just now from Adam, that the, the breadth of opportunity that is available for people to work behind the scenes. So let's start with you, Danny. I mean, what's the different type of professions or jobs that are available where you work in behind the scenes? I'm quite, quite huge and quite varied, to be honest. Um, I think I think over the last five or six years, and I guess everyone will probably um, add to this at some, in some way, the, the breadth of kind of sports science support in, in, in the high performance world has, has massively grown. So you've got your your standard sports science support, your psychologist, your physio, um, sports therapy, um, nutrition, uh, performance, lifestyle, and, and wellness and mental health. That's a, a new thing coming in. Strength and conditioning is is is, is, a, is a huge one and there's a huge surge in, in people wanting to get into strength and conditioning. <clears throat> and then I guess behind that, there's a more general kind of sports science. Uh, in my world now, sitting more in, in the innovation world, there's a lot of um, technology, engineering, um, people who look in, who want to look into research, applied research, so PhDs, and we, we have a, a string of, of PhD students who are kind of in, in the kind of research world. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge scope and you can throw your blanket a, across a, a wide range of things. And we have placement programs that, that run. And um, Ollie mentioned them before that when he was a student, we, we run a, a placement program that recruits every year, three or four people that we try and give a bespoke experience of experience across the, the wide range of different um, career options that exist in high performance sport. But it's quite varied, I think. Adam, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the one of the really helpful things that's available for, for young people now, the, the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences actually now produce a, a guide to careers in sport and exercise science. And it's, you know, been being revised fairly recently and that starts to look at the different types of careers that are available and it is really broad and there are lots of options there to meet a, a, wide, a wide range of interests now so whether you're looking at a career in kind of elite sport and performance or whether you're looking at a career that's more in research teaching coaching sport development type areas or whether you're looking at a career that's more focused around kind of clinical exercise health and fitness those sorts of things there's lots of different uh, available progression routes now from, from sport and exercise science degrees. Certainly <laughs> many more than I was aware of back in the day when I was doing my, when I was doing my, my undergrad, <laughs> my postgrad school. I think the, the progress and the support that's available there for young people as well to try to not only find out what those careers are, but also how to access those careers is, you know, has it improved significantly in recent years. It's funny because Danny mentioned about the, the wellness side of things and, and the mental health side of things. I mean, for you, Adam, how much has you have you seen that grow over the last few years? Yeah, hugely, hugely significant, uh, both in terms of the, uh, I guess the the wider recognition and appreciation of uh, kind of mental health, well being within uh, athletes at lots of different levels, not only not only at an elite level now, and I think the you know the appreciation and the support that and um, more the support that's available for athletes now. Uh, at different levels and the types of support that are available for people to be able to meet the demands of different level is certainly growing and has grown in recent years. Again, uh, as always, there'll be more work that can be done as our understanding of some of the different pressures and some of the different some of the different demands becomes more refined over time. Um, but yeah, as you as you know, it huge huge increases in recent years 
uh, and that can only be a good thing really when we start to consider you know the idea of we need to be looking after the you know the whole athlete Amy, I want to talk to you about female coaches because we've seen Judy Murray. She runs a program to encourage more females to get involved in coaching. We've seen a huge explosion in women being involved in the in football as well. We've seen a few female football managers. But when I speak to young people in terms of young women, they're still a little bit nervous about becoming coaches. How can we make it more attractive for women to join the rank and file, if you like? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, UK coaching are doing a lot of work on this, and I think there's a statistic that I think it's less than 30% of coaches are female. So, and 30% might, might be really high. I might be kind of over exaggerating there, but I think um, there's a lot of work that is being done, and there is still to be done around how we attract females to coaching. So, for example, even on a lot of coaching degrees, there's a much higher percentage of um, male to female and I think one of the main things and one of the most obvious things is how we use um, people like Judy Murray um, and other people as role models and um, to make sure that you know there's you've got to kind of see it to be it um, and that's been like there's been a big push for that more recently especially within women's football um, but I do think that we need to break some of the kind of misconceptions around coaching as well. Um, there's a lot of work in and around well-being has already been mentioned, but I think one of the main constraints in coaching is that it's seen as a 24-hour job, um, and it's you know especially for women with with children and, and families, there's kind of the whole stereotype around um, kind of you know being able to to manage family and career um, and there's some research done in in Norway that found that women at the age of 20 uh, at the age of 29 and um, the number of female coaches was decreasing so again there needs to be a lot of kind of work done to unpick some of that that research and these findings and look at how we can support more women to manage a career especially within high performance sport because I'm sure some of the guys on here will agree with me is you know, there's, it's a high, um, kind of, it's a very taxing, high demanding role, um, and that might be quite difficult for a lot of um, females that that want to have, kind of, have it all, have the family. Not, and, and I, I must say that that doesn't mean that men and fathers don't. You have to be at home and look after the family. I don't want to get into a whole gender debate, um, but in general there's some of the potential issues of why there may be kind of less females working in elite spot. It's a really good point you make because I think Tracy Neville, before she stepped down as England head coach of the England netball team, she talked about her desire to have a family and that was one <clears> of the many reasons that she decided to step down. What can be done to create more pathways, do you think, for women to become coaches, Amy? So linking to the the idea around kind of having a family, I think if you look at some sports like uh, sn snowboarding and um, surfing do this really well. So the family is part of the culture. So a, a lot of these women are allowed to bring children to work um, and men, not not just women, but um, yeah. And I think that that is starting to change where um, different kind of NGBs, different sports, different cultures are, are kind of bringing the family into the fold. Um, so that's one thing, um, but I do think there are some really good initiatives. For example, um, the FA are putting on a lot of kind of female only coaching courses. Um, and sometimes that kind of initial barrier for women, um, they, they might feel a little bit less confident going into the, the coaching kind of circle or going onto a coaching course, which is predominantly men. And um, they may feel kind of a little bit inferior in that situation. Some women, not all, um, but the FA are doing a really good job and have put on some female only uh, initiatives. Similarly with cycling, and um, they've kind of, uh, British Cycling have done a big initiative to try and um, attract a lot more female coaches. Um, and again, putting on kind of more female only um, kind of programs and, um, and, and courses. So I think, the first step is to provide that them opportunities for females in, in coaching and in, in them circles. Um, and then also recognizing that um, 
you know, women can and, and are coaching at the same level as men. And um, it's just providing them opportunities. You mentioned football there, Amy. I'm going to come to you now, uh, Oliver, and talk about your work at, at Reading FC. We know that particularly in football, sports science is such a big part of a player's game. For somebody who doesn't know how that works, can you just give us a brief overview? Yeah, so it's uh, it's definitely becoming a, a, a massive area of the game. Um, I'm very lucky in the fact that the, the coach I actually work with is very uh, receptive to to all the new sports science. Um, he's done a degree himself, so he so he understands it, which is great. Um, but it's everything now. From it's not just about getting players on the pitch, running them until they're sick in pre season, and just doing the technical tactical stuff. It's all about how can we make these players elite athletes and how can we make them as, as fit as we possibly can um, to reach that next stage. Um, everything from nutrition, uh, GPS analysis, um, hydration assessments, um, fitness testing, strength and conditioning. Um, I remember when I first started, I, I came into it and there was my boss and then like another person similar to me. So we had three people in the department. I look at it now, we've now got five sports scientists. We've got a strength and conditioning coach. Um, we're hoping to get a nutritionist in, and that's just in the academy. We've got three um, analysts, five physios, the, 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 the broad range of people now working um, in football outside of the coaching is, is ever increasing, um, which, is, which is really promising. Um, now, what I would say is we're, I would always see us as support staff. So the players are there to become footballers, um, but we will do everything we can to, like I said, improve them from a physical side of things or um, a psychological, psychological side. We have two psychologists working at the club as well. Um, but it's all about building relationships as well and, and, and having um, good connections with people. Uh, so, yeah. You make such an excellent point, Oliver, the fact that, you know, five, ten years ago, sports science, and particularly particularly football, wouldn't have been thought about at all. And now it's such a crucial part of a player's life and part of a club as well. And I guess you're you're quite lucky, as you mentioned, that you have a club that has bought into that and seen it very much a part of the club's DNA. Would you agree with that? hundred um... percent. Again, it goes it goes down to the mentors that I had when I first started. They've really built a good culture at Reading, but it's not it's not just at Reading. It's it's at clubs all across the country now. Um, everybody seems to be embracing it, trying to improve those little one percent to um, get more wins on the pitch because that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, from an academy side of things, it's about getting players into the first team, um, and obviously, first team is about winning. Um, but it's definitely grown within the past eight years that I've been there. Um, it's it's moved on dramatically, and I think it will only ever start. It will only continue to to improve as we, as we move along. Staying with you, actually, Oliver, I'd like to ask you. You mentioned about qualifications at, right at the beginning. If if a sixteen to an eighteen year old approached you and said, "Look, I'm interested in a career in in sport and exercise science. What qualifications do I need?" What would you say? The first thing would would, would be a degree, um, but one of the one of the best things that came out of my degree was the opportunities that Bournemouth provided me to do sort of extra qualifications so I, I did um, I did my uh, FA level two coaching football um, I did a I got a qualification in working with disabled children I got a qualification in, in teaching badminton I any qualification that was put available put on offer to me I, I just took it and embraced it with open <laughs> arms because I think you never know when it could come in use. So when I look now at some of something as simple as some of the warm ups that I do, I will look back at what I learned in different aspects of qualifications and, and try and put it into into what I'm doing in a day to day in, in my day to day job. Um, so obviously your, your, your degree is, is probably is, is the big one. But I would say do as much as you can outside of that and get as many qualifications as you can, whether or not you think they might be relevant because um, they will undoubtedly could become uh, relevant the further along you go in your career. Amy, I guess if somebody's thinking about going to university, it's a really big decision to make about which is the right university to go to. And I'm not, I don't want to start any university wars on this webinar because I know a couple of you work for uni, but how, is, how important is it to 
for a young person to do their research and, and make sure it's the right university for them to study their sport and exercise science degree? Um, I think one of the most important things is around um, what they want from, from the degree. So there are um, some very good universities in and around not just the Northwest, but the whole country. So Leeds Beckett, for example, is, is a really highly respected um, university for sport and exercise science, as is Liverpool John Moores University. I think one of the most important things to do is research kind of the specific area of sports science that you might be interested in, so if it's physiology, biomechanics, psychology, and look at maybe the, the people that work there and look at the links that the university has to um, different, different clubs, different opportunities. So something that like we really pride ourselves on is our links to, especially football, we've got Liverpool and Everton, um, in the city and we can we, we provide opportunities for students to kind of be exposed to them environments um, again we've got all kind of we've got different rugby clubs surrounding the city um, and one yeah again it's all about what what's your sport what's your discipline and and who works at the university potentially that you might be interested in learning from so there are some of the things, and one of the main things as well that students look at is the city itself. So do I want to be in a city that is, um, you know, more rural, more um, kind of vibrant? And I know that's kind of less about the, the, the degree in the university, but I do think that's a really important thing that for a student to consider. And again, I'm very biased, but Liverpool is a pretty cool city to be in. <laughs> I don't want to start university wars now, people, honestly. But actually, Amy, in all seriousness, you have a really good point because, again, if I was a young person looking to go to university, but I wanted to a uh, sports uh, career, sport and exercise science career in football, I wouldn't necessarily choose a university that is steeped in history with rugby, for example. So for you, Adam, how crucial is it when someone is looking at a university that they align it to the sports that they want to work in in the future? Yeah, I think to, you know, to echo some of the points that, that Amy made, I think if you consider that, if we look at sport and exercise science degrees, I don't think I'm going to be breaking any state secrets here when I say that if you're doing a true sport and exercise science degree, you're going to do physiology, psychology, biomechanics, research methods, something to do with employability, those sorts of things. So the advice that I tend to give to young people when they're looking at you choosing degree courses is, yeah, you need to appreciate the course content and those sorts of things, but what else comes along with, with part of that? What are the other opportunities that are there? What are the facilities that you're going to be able to access and use to support your learning? Placement opportunities, additional study opportunities, um, and just remembering that, you know, going to un your degree course is one part of why you go to university. It's, you know, a, it's part of a wider process of growing and developing as a person, as an individual. So from from that perspective, yeah, you know, if you've got a, a real interest in, a, in one particular sport, then there are universities that might specialise in those. And there are even degree courses that specialise in those individual sports. But... One of the things that is becoming, again, much more prominent is how much sports are learning from each other as well and how actually, you know, if you kind of go down that route of only being involved in one sport and only having an interest in one sport, you might end up doing yourself a little bit of a disservice in the in, in the longer term and actually exposing yourself to what, you know, some of the, the working cultures that can take place in different sports can provide some real valuable learning experiences. Um, so for me... The advice that I always give to young people when they're looking at when they're looking at choosing their degree course is is about the is about the whole picture. It's the people. It's it's who you're going to be exposed to. It's how, how the teaching and learning you know practices are, are undertaken. All those sorts of things, and the, they're all really important. So that the important parts of the decision making process. You know, in terms of sport and exercise science, for example. Is the degree course endorsed by by the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences as part of their undergraduate endorsement scheme? You know, we, we know that that's a, that's an important part in terms of later steps down in terms of your professional journey. So all those sorts of things can play a really important part in the decision making. Also, for you, Danny, how important is it for somebody to maybe a young person go and have a conversation with somebody who works in in sports science? Uh, I think it's huge. I think just jumping jumping back quickly on some of the points covered from 
uh, from the rest of you guys on here now is um, <clears throat> academically, I think it's almost a given now in terms of people applying for, for, for roles in high performance that they, they've got a degree. Uh, and to some extent, a lot are now having masters. Um, from my side, I think that's, that's just a tick in the box and a, a more to be expected. But, I mean, I've recruited a lot now over the last 15 years into, into, into sport as practitioners and, and various, various roles. And for me, it's the bits to sit in between the academic knowledge, which is um, what, stand, what makes people stand out. <clears throat> so, I mean, like Oli talks around your, your coaching experience, your ability to go and, like you say, um, speak to people understand um, the, the environment that you're, you're wanting to work in. For me, it's academic knowledge is one side, but what's gonna stand you out in, in, in sport is that it, for me, it's a people's business and your ability to uh, interact with uh, people, communicate in a way that's gonna sit at, the, at their level and not at a, an academic level um, is, is basically what I look for in, in high performance sport. And I, I, I will kind of stand here and say from my side that that is what really makes uh, the difference and, and can help deliver performance. I want to talk about skills now, because obviously in all your roles, which is quite varied and very diverse, you bring different skills to the table. So Amy, let's start with you. What is the key skills for your job? There's many. <laughs> um, but I think linking on, linking on from what Danny's just said, I think one of the most important things is around communication. So um, it's great for us to have the, the knowledge, to have the qualifications, um, but especially in a, a coaching and a sports psychology setting, one of the biggest things is our ability to communicate um, and to, to develop relationships with other people. Um, because again, ultimately, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't communicate that effectively with someone, then it's pointless having it because you're not be, you can't share that knowledge. Um, and I'm sure that uh, the rest of the guys will agree with me that without you know, that ability to, to develop these relationships, you, you can't, you, you're stuck, you, you're not going anywhere. So I, I guess communication and building relationships is probably one of the most important skills, in my opinion. Danny, what can you add to that list? So we've got communication is probably the key one. Is there anything else? I mean, I guess from, from the role the role I sit in at the moment and, and having progressed over over the last decade or so, skills around like influencing is is a is a big skill. So it kind of links into communication, but it's not just um, your dialogue and, and imparting information back, but actually how you how do you get people to um, see different perspectives and, and, and influence to a certain direction? I mean, I'm heavily involved in leadership now and leading a, a high performance program, so it's about um, having confidence in your own mindset and being creative. So your, your creative uh, ability, ability to, to, to see big picture. And I think that's something that um, <clears throat> see I'm seeing less and less of in people coming through um, through the university system and coming in to, to apply jobs is they're, they're very good in their little niche um, academic area or, or, or discipline or psychologists or, or kind of sports science, but the ability to see the big picture of, of uh, the world of sport um, and where to, that's a, something that is a skill set in itself and not everyone has that. Uh, and I think it's something people need to, to pay attention to. So th those are the things I probably would, would add to that. But I think communication is, 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 the, is the big, big one because sport is whatever level you're at, whether it's grassroots and coaching kids and working in schools to, to high performance, it's a people's business. And if you can't um, engage with people, then fundamentally you're, you're in the wrong business. Ollie, I guess for you, one of the skills that you've got to be on top of is being, being able to organise your diary and, and organise yourself. Would you agree with that? 100%. Um, just going back to the points that guys have made, communication for me and relation, building relationships are absolutely vital for everything, for organisation and also have, being able to adapt. So adaptability, I think, is is really key as well. It's as much as we're very much organizers and planners and going through university you you get taught about periodization you get taught about planning this that and the other in the world of, of professional sport and especially football for me it's so it changes all the time 
it, from not only week to week, but it could be day to day. It could even be within the last hour. Uh, you thought you were going to be working with 20 players, which is great. But all of a sudden, you're now working with 17 players. And it's like, right, okay, how do you adapt? And you have to always contingency plan. Um, and you have to enjoy doing that, I think. I remember when I first started, it was quite difficult because as I just, I was fresh out of uni, I'd got all these plans and sometimes it wouldn't work. And I'd be like, well, well right, what do I do? What do I do? And you need to develop that pretty quickly and enjoy doing it um because it can happen at any moment um you have to just be able to adapt to, to to what what is put in front of you really um and i guess just the other point would be would be empathy working with a lot of players and um, working with different coaches you you get people from different backgrounds all the time and you get people as much as they are there as professional football players uh they are still human beings and you have to understand that someone might be going through something at home there might be something going on outside of the club, there might be something going on within the club, contract negotiations, you have to be able to understand that if you've asked somebody to do something, um, that they might be struggling to to potentially do it. And it's not just a case that they don't want to, but you have to understand. And again, that comes down to communication, building relationships. You have to have that uh, in order to understand all your athletes. Adam, so far we've had communication, influence, seeing the bigger picture, building relationships, adaptability, organization skills and, and empathy as well mm. have you got one or two that you can add to that list yeah i think probably ending on one or two would be around this idea that being able to um communicate with different people within for example within a multidisciplinary team being able to communicate with different people in different ways about the same thing so, for example, when you, you know, if you start looking at injury prevention, for uh, just just as a as a as an example here, you might have one person in, within a multidisciplinary team who the thing that they really want to be able to talk to you about is some of the mental health concerns that might come along with with an athlete that's been injured, and how we deal with that. Whereas somebody else might be more bothered about well, what are the what are the physical preparation strategies and what are the rehab strategies or prehab strategies that we need to do to prevent injury. Whereas somebody else might be looking at the point of view well well in professional football injuries cost a total of about 45 million quid a year when you're looking at top level football so from a health economics point of view what do we need to know about that so i think it's very much being able to uh, understand and understand and appreciate the perspectives of lots of other people who might be as passionate as you about a particular topic area but for a different reason and have the kind of the, the flexibility and the adaptability to be able to move within those different types of conversations and work with those different types of practitioners in such a way that you're able to to work towards and achieve those those common goals um and i guess really from that point of view accepting that being right and being wrong in inverted commas um for a lot of young people now that's the thing that they're really, really concerned about. I want to know what the right answer is and I want to know that all the time so I can share that. When actually what's right or wrong really can be a matter of opinion and it's more about being able to think quite critically about what are the different perspectives that are available, understanding each of those different perspectives and being able to draw on those to be able to make the decisions that you need to make in what can quite often be quite fast paced, quite challenging, quite high demand type environments, particularly if you're moving higher and higher up in, into, you know, the more the more elite or the very highest levels of sport. Um, you know, and, and like I say, and recognising that, I guess really the, the, the best people in those environments are the people that get the job done. But the people that get the job done are the people that have got the right blend of both hard and soft skills. That's a really interesting point you make, Adam, because as you were talking, I was thinking about for some people, if they want to work in those top, top level jobs, that comes with a lot of pressure and they're having to deal with several priorities at the right time, yeah. as well as juggling a lot of priorities in the air as well. How does a young person, if they're thinking about their career, how can we explain to them that this is part of the job and if this is something you want to do you have to open your mind to the fact that you might be under a bit of pressure to deliver certain things yeah and I, I think there are ways that we you know that we do consciously work to try to do that through <coughs> excuse me through undergraduate degrees in terms of how they're run you know we we work to try to support young people to become more autonomous have more control over their programs of study and be you know in a very you know progressively independent way you know th even things like 
organizing uh, assignment calendars and all those sorts of things and taking responsibility for that and being the people who are being proactive in coming and organizing meetings and those sorts of things all of those are little are little steps on the journey for uh, for getting people used to actually approaching people in different types of positions managing different types of demands managing time demands and those sorts of things it's all it's all part of that developmental journey but the other part of it you know as as, um, as no doubt colleagues will be aware that this type of you know this type of experience is quite valuable for young people because <clears throat> one of the things that we know is that the people that are coming into into degree courses like to have access to people that have done the job so for example you know, we're, we're quite 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 fortunate that a part of our part of our teaching team is is made up of people who are researchers who are practitioners who have got backgrounds in teaching people who have blended all three so quite fortunate that young people that, that access in our type of degree program have done the roles and can answer those questions but we're also fortunate for this type where people that work in those types of roles are able to give that information first hand as so again you know it, it's it's all well and good the person who's doing the teaching or who's facilitating the learning talking about the importance of this and almost imparting that information but a really important part of it is facilitating the opportunities for people to be able to create and construct that understanding for themselves and start to explore the different ways that it might be important or why it's important or how it changes in different environments What's different between, you know, uh, working within track and field athletics to working in elite level football, or what's different to working in the Premier League to working in League Two? Those sorts of things, and understanding. You know, we've spoken a lot about placements, for example, and the advice that I always give to the young people that are accessing our degree course about placements within sport is the two best things that you can do when you first go in there is, is listen and observe listen to the people that work within the environment learn about the context observe the context see how different people work together in different ways how are problems solved how are problems managed how do problems arrive how can we preempt them in a way that will um, you know perhaps stop them from coming about too much you know all, all those sorts of things become really important around um, and become really quite valuable developmental experiences so it, it it's the, I guess the short answer would be it's the managed and staged exposure to those different types of demands in a way that blends challenge and support so we can create more of a facilitative environment rather than a relentless one. And finally, for you guys, let's talk about life at college and university. If you're above the age of 18, a big part of that is the social side of university or college life and also about extracurricular activities. So starting with you, um, Danny, what activities outside of a young person studying for a degree or, or, or an A-level at college, what should they be doing in terms of extracurricular activities? What would you advise? I mean, I think it's, I, I think if you're in a lucky position where you know that uh, the direction you want to go in terms of your, your ideal career, I mean, some people might be at university and, and, and it's kind of quite wide and then haven't narrowed it down yet. But if you if you have that idea of where you want to go, I think it's about seeking opportunities to to gain experience. So for me, is um, it ties everything we've talked around together. The, the ability to to seek out applied experience, whether that's um, uh, actually coaching coaching just kids, yeah, it's a kids team at whatever sport, and doesn't need to be in a, a specific sport because that practices communication skills, the ability to deliver information, um, getting out and talking to people. And I think for me, it's about uh, what I would suggest is is that if you're if you're sitting in front of a, a prospective employer in two or three years time post university is actually showing that you utilize that opportunity and that time you've had to develop skills or or gain a broader um, extent to knowledge beyond academia um, sits in the outside world and then you can actually if you have that you have the ability to to start to to bring your academic knowledge and apply it into a, to a real world setting. And that for me is the bit that I would always look to on a CV as someone applying for jobs is how have they gone about bridging that gap between um, a job and and academia, that bit in the middle. So anything really from just being in sport, talking, observing, uh, even just reading, but your ability to about articulate it back to someone when you're sat over an interview. Well, I'm often asked about my role as a sports broadcaster and journalist and I'm asked about well, how often do you watch sport Amory and I said well when it's on pretty much every day when I come in there's there'll be a, some sort of 
match happening at the weekend. I, if there's nothing, I'll, I'll look on the internet because I, for me, it's a part of my life. Sport is is embedded in me, and and I want to show that I've got knowledge and understanding of, of the game that I'm watching. And in case a future employer like Danny suggested might ask me, well, did you watch the the FA Cup of 2012 and who was the winner and who were the managers and who were the two teams etc etc to a young person how do you get across the need to make sure that you've got a good level of knowledge of the sport that you want to work in um i, I think if you want to go into the industry of of a of a sports scientist or a sports psychologist or working in in the industry you, you have to you have to enjoy sport i think um i would watch anything when it was on really um, and I look now when I work back with the, some of the younger kids, even like under nines, under tens, we're doing multi sports, and that's the big thing at the moment is getting getting children to do as many sports as possible. Um, so you have to take an interest in it. Um, like I've mentioned, I, I was I was I think everybody on on this talk now has has always been a big lover of sports, um, <coughs> but it's it's and like's been mentioned, it's not just the academia. Um, you have to have those other soft skills and have to have that knowledge and love for what you do. So if you're going into the industry when you you don't really you're not really a big fan of sport, it's it's maybe worth thinking is it is it right for you? Um, you don't have to watch every single sport, but I think having a having an interest in uh, about five or six different sports will, will always be a benefit to you. Um, yeah, you, you you have to love it if you want to work in it. I think. And Amy, I guess a, a young person they need to understand that this is a big commitment to take on because if this is if this is if this is their future path, then it becomes a part of their life pretty much twenty four seven days a week. How do you get that across to your to your students? Yeah, I think um, just by saying it as you are, but I think as well going back to everything that's already been said, I think communicating to students that it or should be um, a part of their life if they want to pursue and be really successful in a career in sport. So for example, um, we have students that go on to be PE teachers and, and uh, the big discussion I, we have with students is, well, what, what's your sport? Um, because uh, for me, I think that's also something that's really important. Um, it, that doesn't mean that we expect our students to be you know, elite level athletes, but just to have an interest or not even sport, maybe participating in, in some kind of exercise. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of be role models and um, we've got to kind of practice what we preach. Um, and to some extent, more successful people do. Um, so yeah, I think especially for students going into teaching, for example, that's a three year degree plus a, an extra kind of teaching qualification on top of that. That's four years of study before they reach um, their potential career. Again, in coaching, you do a three year degree, you might have to go on and do a master's and gain X amount of years and um, work in kind of a, a lower level before you might reach kind of working in an elite level sport. To be a sport psychologist, that takes even longer. So you've got to do your degree, your master's and, a, and another two years on top of that to become a, an accredited sport and exercise psychologist. So I think it's really important that we do make it clear to them that they've if, if they've got to be in it for the long haul, if, if they want to be successful. Um, and I'm sure most, sorry, and I'm sure everyone else will, will agree that it, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication, not just within your degree, but everything else on top of that that's already been mentioned today. Um, yeah, so sorry to cut you off. No, no, it's fine. It's, it's a really good point. Again, in my profession, it's getting across to a young person that, this will become your life. Those days of, you know, sitting at home on a Friday night watching a box set such as Game of Thrones, that doesn't really exist anymore for me. And having to miss birthdays <laughs> and christenings and Mother's Days and Father's Days purely because I'm working is, you know, they, I still have those difficult conversations now with my mum when I tell her I can't come around for lunch on, on Mother's Day because I'm, I have to work. So it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really good point you make, Amy, about how much of a life sport will take up. But as you say, if you love it, then you know it's all good i mean for you adam is there anything you want to add to what else everyone has said uh, I, in terms of advice i guess some of the important some of the important parts will be around yeah it, you are looking at this as a long-term journey but 
listen to the listen to the real life experiences of people that have, that have done the job because they're some of the most important teachable moments. You know, it's nice. It's, for me, it's nice to hear. It's nice to hear people that are, that work in those types of roles say openly say things to students like, "If you're doing it because you want to be able to say that you work at this club or that club and and get the kit, then." Go to the sports shop, it's cheaper, it won't take you anywhere near as long, and it's nowhere near as stressful. Um, but it's you know, it's also it's also nice when I you know, when I when I hear people and to be honest, when I share some of the stories as well around some of the greatest times that you'll have, all being the four o'clock in the morning start off coach journey when you're on the team coach and you're going down there and you're having a do part of your team prep and you're getting to know the people that you're working with in such a great way because you're sending you're spending such a you know, focused period of time with them. Um, so those sorts of things are really nice and embrace those. But I guess one of the important parts as well would be always remember that you're working with people. People people make teams, teams create organisations and so on and so forth. The fundamental part of it is you're working with people. So during your degree course, take the opportunity to work with people as much as you can. It doesn't matter if it's your local sports team. It doesn't matter if it's a you know public a public kind of public health environment those sorts of things don't don't be that person that kind of goes onto the degree course and says i only want to do a placement with insert name of elite sports team be the person that goes in there and will take any opportunity to work with people as much as you possibly can do because that's where you get to apply the hard skills and develop the soft skills can i just can i just Guys, add to that? i think one of the one of the yeah, please big, do. sorry what Sorry, just one of the big questions that you get asked in an, in an interview, and I've obviously been on on both sides, is what experience have you got of, of working in 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 sport, not necessarily elite sport. If you're trying to get into the industry, and you and someone comes in and says, "Yeah, but I've got this, I've got this qualification, that qualification," um, but have you applied it? And they say, "No, but I know this, this, and this." I think, like like I mentioned, I think getting out there and actually practicing those skills, and like you say, working with non-league teams working with grassroots kids working with different sports i think having the experience alongside that is 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 vital yeah really good points and you know guys thank you i've me personally i've learned so much from chatting to you all today it's been fascinating to hear about your journey and and the depth and breadth of opportunity that's available for working in sport and exercise science so my thank you for your time today i really really appreciate it so my thanks to uh, dr amy whitehead from liverpool john moore's university amy how can people find you on social media or online yeah they can find me on twitter at uh, at a underscore whitehead one um or they can uh, find me on the lgmu website as well if anyone wants any further information brilliant Thank you. My thanks to Danny Holcroft from the British Bobsleigh and Skeleton. How can people find you online or on social media? Yeah, I'm on uh, on, on Twitter, uh, DH2014. Brilliant. Thank you. My thanks also to Dr. Adam Gledhill from Leeds Beckett University. How can we find you on social media and or online, Adam? Yeah, I mean, my, my profile is available through the university website or on Twitter, my Twitter accounts at Gleds13 or on Instagram, it's Dr. Adam Gledhill. And also, and finally, my thank you to Oliver Harrington from Reading FC. How can we find you on social media or online, Ollie? Uh, yeah, my Twitter handle is uh, at Ollie Harrington, um, or you can find me on LinkedIn, add me on there and, um, and, and send me a message. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching the Careers in Sport webinar. We focused on sport and exercise science. I hope you've learned loads. I've learned absolute tons today. It's been a fascinating chat with our guests. And of course, you can find Careers in Sport online at careers-in-sport.co.uk and on social media as well. And also, Adam mentioned this earlier, do check out BASES, which is the British Association of Sport and Exercise Science at bases.org.uk. It is the largest sport and exercise science network in the UK. Thank you for joining us today on this webinar. Watch this space for more careers in sport webinars, and we'll see you real soon.